Support Celtic Warrior workouts and give me a subscribe. Oh, and also uh, support Wrestle Talk and give them a subscribe. Support Wrestle Talk. Could we see some big debuts tomorrow night on AEW's Double or Nothing? I am Luke and This is El Fakador Laurie Blake. Welcome to the Wrestle Talk Podcast Magazine show each and every single Friday here on Wrestle Talk's YouTube show and on the podcast form and all that sort of stuff. Right, so it's Double or Nothing tomorrow night, AEW's second pay per view of 2020, and their first in the Steve Carino. Uh, situation, but it's also their first in this sort of post WWE mass release era because they had their big releases sort of a couple of uh, last month, in fact. So there has been a lot of speculation about who could possibly debut at AEW Double or Nothing, particularly because they've got a mystery entrance in the casino ladder match. So, uh, first things first, Laurie, do you think we'll see a debut tomorrow night? I mean, by all accounts, Luke, uh, <laughs> it's not a good time to do debuts, is it? <laughs> but that's not stopped them. That's nope. not stopped AEW. They've had Matt Hardy, they've had Brody Lee all debut under these conditions. So yeah. I, I think, yes, I, I think they're likely to have someone. Um, they, they, they like to have a regular influx of new faces or old faces. Uh, even if it's just like a, a legend comes back for one match, I think that that's kind of the way AEW likes to operate. It is operating in that nostalgia bubble of wrestling. Um, and, you know, it, it is very much a for the fans, by the fans product. So mm -hmm. I, I think I think, I think think we're so likely to get a somebody uh, appearing in that ladder match. I don't know if they're going to win it. Um, I, I feel like walking in the door and immediately getting a title shot doesn't necessarily fit any of the people who've been released either. I don't, I don't think anyone who's been released is big enough to sort of to, to justify going straight in against John Moxley. Uh, yeah. Or um, Brody Lee, obviously. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's definitely on the cards. That, why would you do a mystery opponent if, if it's not going to be someone interesting? If you're not going to build into speculation that like the rest of the roster are fighting over that remaining spot, like to, to keep it a complete secret just suggests it's someone we don't even, we haven't even fathomed. That's exactly it, right? Like, it's, if it was, I, I said this in the predictions video that we did yesterday. If it's Jimmy Havoc, and I love Jimmy Havoc, but if it's someone like a Jimmy Havoc, then you're like, well, you may as well just announce them ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Like, you didn't need to have kept that such a secret going into this. So it's either got to be a big return, which I don't think AEW particularly have anyone that's sort of been missing for a long time that could then return into this match, or it's got to be a debut. Um, whether that is someone who is ex WWE or perhaps even someone like a Jeff Cobb, I don't know where Jeff Cobb currently is in the in the world at the moment. Um, but you know, it's it's got to be a name because if it isn't, that would be a disappointment. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is something you want to sort of like set expectations up only to sort of let you down. And that's not us saying they have set the expectation too high and we will be let down if they don't. Like that's them making a rod for their own back. They have set these expectations to be like, it is a mystery opponent. So it's time to get excited now. Yeah, because you could have left, you could have just left that off the, you know, you could have left that off the card completely. If there was going to be a mystery person in the match, it's no different announcing the spot or not announcing the spot, if you get what I mean. Like if you just yeah. surprise people on the day, just going, yeah, there's another entrance in this match. When the match begins, is fine too. I don't know. You don't need to build. You don't need to build hype for a mystery opponent unless it's going to be important. Yeah, exactly. And we've had a, a few people comment on yesterday's video with their speculation on who it's going to be. The biggest name coming out of it was everyone saying, "Guys, it's going to be Zack Ryder." And I've actually had tweets and messages from people this morning saying, "Like, dude, it's not Gulak. It's going to be Zack Ryder." But it can't be Zack because Zach is still under his 90-day non-compete clause, which I think everyone still has about 56 days left on. I think it's like September before any of them can actually go anywhere and, and do any other work. Um, you know, Drake Maverick, Drake Maverick was released on the same day as Zach, and he is still in NXT at the moment as part of that 90-day non-compete. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it can be Zach unless he is just going to forego the 90 day non complete and risk the uh the potential of uh breaching contract and getting sued maybe yeah. maybe he wants to do that but i i can't see that's on the cards 
No, well, I mean, you would be putting WWE in a complete, like, that's a PR nightmare for WWE to sue somebody who they've just fired. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I wouldn't put it past them. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't I don't think it's worth the risk. You don't want to take on a, a billionaire in, in, a, in a suing game. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I feel like, you know, someone like Drew Gulak, who apparently isn't under, like, his contract has just expired and up. So he, yeah. he's just he's just free to work wherever. Um, yeah, anyone else who's sort of more ahead of the curve on that stuff is, is more likely. But then there's also, like, the potential that, you know, people are saying it might be Sting, right? Yeah, so so Sting is a name that has been linked to AEW for the last couple of weeks. He is no longer with WWE. Uh, his Legends contract effectively has just expired and he's not re-signed. Ric Flair has re-signed, though. Ric Flair was up in the air, um, up in the flare, if you will, uh, as to whether he was going to re-sign. But he uh, announced yesterday that he has re-signed with WWE. Sting, on the other hand, has not. Meltzer said on a podcast recently that he thinks there's no smoke without fire when it comes to all of this AEW Sting chat. And what this comes out of is that Mattel, who make all the WWE action figures, announced that they had to remove Sting from their Legend series, quote, due to circumstances out of our control. Uh, and Cody, you know, tweeted a big the gif of him listening, and Sting has been tweeting that he's been watching Dynamite, so he's been you know, tweeting about Jake the Snake and tweeting about Lance Archer. Lance Archer said that he'd love a match with Sting, and I brought this up on yesterday's predictions video that, well, surely Sting can't go because he had that career-ending injury with Seth Rollins at uh, Night of Champions uh, a couple of years ago. But PW Insider reported back in February that Sting was in talks for a return match, most likely at a Saudi Arabia show, because, because of course, it was probably going to be against Goldberg or something. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> every, really <laughs> every cloud has a silver lining, or every <laughs> silver lining has a cloud. I think that's the way around it goes with the Saudi Arabia shows. So, yeah, so apparently, Sting could be good to go. And whether you want to bring him in for just one match, whether you want to bring him in on a Legends deal, whether you want to bring him in to be in that sort of Arn Anderson, Jake role where you just have a protege with you, or Taz, for example, is sort of like uh, is sort of like teasing that sort of thing as well. Yeah, or you bring Sting in for a match, which I suppose then leads to the question, do AEW need Sting? No, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that I don't think it hurts them in any way, shape, or form to have Sting. Uh, you know, I, I, there is this worry I think with AEW that it is just becoming WCW 2.0, and it is heavily relying on ex WWE guys. Like we were saying, we, we were talking about it during the prediction squad. I don't think it made the video, but we were saying that you know everyone who's challenged for the AEW World Championship, except Hangman Page, is an ex WWE guy on pay per view. On, on, yeah, on, on pay per view, yeah. yeah. So like all of their big, but all so all of their main events essentially have been WWE guys. Mm -hmm. um, so it's I think it's important that they that, you know their whole thing was about crafting new talent, um, and you know that's the reason Cody Rhodes has lost all of his matches, you know, because it's all about building these other names. Yeah. However, those other names haven't found themselves any further up the card, seemingly from from winning over Cody or whatever it is. You know, they they are operating still at a level lower than. Your Chris Jericho's and your John Moxley's, etc. So, yeah, whether like whether or not Sting is a good get for AEW is is by the by. It's a great get for AEW. Sting is like one of the most famous faces in wrestling, um, and I, I think yeah, his presence is something that everyone wants to see in in back in wrestling anyway. Um, but yeah, like AEW needs to start knuckling down. I think on really building the new talent and really like setting themselves apart from wwe and yeah you know, and so at some point you've got to make the decision of like maybe we just you know as, as much as people like to see people like Brody lee finally get the push that they deserved in wwe and i'm you know chuffed to bits that that's happening you do need to be like this is this is our show now and this is what we're doing and you know we don't need to back reference WWE all the time because that's you know that's part of Brody Lee's gimmick now is like the the Vince isms etc. Move away and become your own thing. That's kind yeah. of what I'm interested for them to do. Yeah, no, I, I I do agree with that. Particularly like if you are going to bring Sting in, 
then I would want it to be for like a one shot deal, like a one match deal. Like if it's him versus Lance Archer, which feels like that is pure death for Sting. Uh, like, it's, uh, that's an actual murder. For, you for could Sting. just, yeah, you could just write him out of all of life. But it's fine. <laughs> He'll become a literal murder whore. Um, <laughs> But yeah, like you have a one match with, with Lance Archer to put Lance over and have him beat the legend. That's probably, I think, the best use of Sting. What you don't want to do is fall into that TNA trap where you're like, well, Sting's the most over person here. So let's put the belt on him mm-hmm. and sort of always have him in that main event scene at the expense of people like AJ, Joe, Daniels, etc. So yeah, I, I'd kind of like using him in a legend's role to put over younger guys, I think is a much better use of Sting. Having that once a year almost treated like your own version of the undertaker where you just bring him out for one match like all out every year you get your sting match i think that's probably the best use for him not a regular like guy on tv all the time but then it makes any... it, it's very difficult with wrestling isn't it because you have to tread that balance so carefully yeah with legends and stuff like you know like goldberg pops the ratings on smackdown but goldberg also pissed off all the regular fans <laughs> like you know like all, all the really hardcore people like do love goldberg but they also were like i don't want i don't want it to beat the fiend yeah you know, i i am watching this program week to week and i think it's ridiculous that an old man's come back and beat the fiend um <laughs> but yeah like still pops the ratings and sting i think if sting came back and sting appeared at double or nothing that's going to pop the ratings on dynamite next week for sure because people are going to think man he might turn up on dynamite now so you have to kind of get yourself out of the mindset of being like, well, that means he's a world champion, right? Exactly. Like, you know, right, you, yeah. you have to you you have to use it to build the new talent, and that's one thing that WWE has been bad at, and one thing that AEW I think so far has used their legends quite well to build new people. Yeah. So the other potential names that could debut are Drew Gulak, which you mentioned earlier, because his contract expired with WWE, and uh, that means that he's free to go wherever he wants. So he could show up. He could be in that ladder match. And the other is The Revolt, uh, the Mm -hmm. former revival of WWE. Uh, They, again, had their contracts expire. They weren't let go. They weren't released. They were just let go effective immediately, which means they're free to go wherever they want. Now, whether that means that they're going to show up in AEW this weekend is unknown. Same with Gulag. But there is the potential that they could go. And I've got to think, like based off the Talk is Jericho podcast they did as well, they are they're working something with the young bucks like they are working towards them being like you know we're still not over the ftr thing they never reached out to us we've never seen an episode of being the elite this and the other i think they're working an angle with them yeah and also i mean like also they they have in very short shrift got the name of the new team they've got all the branding there are hats out in the world with a logo (laughs) on that people have got like you don't do that if you're six months out from return you know like you do you do sort of um a lot of the people who were released on on uh, a couple of weeks ago quickly got t-shirts out because obviously like your finances essentially have become in jeopardy so you put some merch out in the world but you don't redesign everything ready to go ready to sell uh if you're sort of going to wait six months because the, the sort of height you want you want the merch to hit as the hype hits right like that's exactly kind of like, yeah so you, i think you would do that get those things ready and get them in place because you're going to make a debut that's what i would do yeah uh right well speaking of aew and uh, nxt let's look at the ratings for this week uh the double or nothing go home show of dynamite averaged seven hundred and one thousand viewers which is up seven percent from last week which is pretty good for a go home show and there was some concern because there's a nascar race on fs1 which did two million viewers that it was going to affect both aew and nxt and what it looks like is actually it didn't affect AEW, but it did affect NXT. Because NXT was down again from last week to five, nine, two thousand viewers. Um, so and that combined viewership of 1.2 million between Dynamite and NXT is the third lowest since the start of the Wednesday Night Wars. AEW did a 0.26 in the key demo, which is up 13% from last week. Uh, and NXT fell out of the top 50 in that demo once again with a 0.13 rating, which is down. from last week. So not a great week for NXT, but from what I can gather as well, because I actually haven't had a chance to catch up with the show yet, it wasn't a particularly newsworthy show. Yeah, I think this is this is becoming the problem with NXT, is that we've been saying it on the podcast a fair bit, is that, you know, like 
it does just feel like nothing is happening <laughs> you know like yeah. even when things happen it feels like it's not like there's no driving force and that was because you know and i was saying that was because originally because there was no takeover and now we've got takeover in your house um announced but then uh, yeah i guess like the uh, the looming threat of nascar did it this week <laughs> yeah I, yeah I, I feel like it's got back on you know once you once you've got somewhere that we're going with everything i feel like you kind of when you've got those tent poles to build your stories around you feel like there's going to be conclusions to things um and so i think it's easier to buy in but clearly yeah the sort of every match being about three minutes long and there just being loads of stuff uh isn't chiming very well with the viewing audience which i, I think is a general problem with resting in lockdown as it is it's just it's yeah. just not a very compelling program anymore which is a shame as well because they've got a heck of a card for takeover in your house oh yeah friggin hell that's a hell of a card carrying yeah. cross tomaso champa yes oh, bloody what? please sir. oh mate keith lee johnny gargano yes bloody please mate. matt riddle and timothy thatcher just attempting oh. to choke <laughs> each other out oh yeah I'm all for it. All right, well, let's dive into the mailbag. If you want to submit a question to the mailbag, all you've got to do is become one of our pledge hammers on Patreon today. You can use this link uh, here, or you can use it for in the show notes, uh, and you can just submit a question to the mailbag in the community tab. Do not email me. I will just lose it. Um, in fact, actually, someone did send me a message. I think Pete sent me a message saying that someone did get in touch because they couldn't, that's just reminded me, me saying that I'm bad at my job mm -hmm. has just reminded me that I think How Pete bad you are over, job. <laughs> well, Pete sent, I'm pretty sure Pete sent over one that said like, oh yeah, this person couldn't get in touch because they couldn't get the community tab to work. So much later that the old narrator got tired of waiting and they had to hire a new one. Right, I found it now. Uh, so yeah, Pete sent me a message uh, saying a patron bracket isn't able to post in the community section. Not sure why Patreon's looking into it saying, basically my girlfriend isn't a fan of wrestling but has an open mind and is willing to give it a chance. Would you, uh, what would be your perfect match on a card to convert someone into being a fan? I'm sure you've answered this before, but it would make uh, him happy if you could uh, make a note of it. Thanks. So yes, so um, what would be your perfect match to convert someone into being a fan? Oh, it's so hard though, because it's like, I think when, what what kind of fan do you want to create? Do you want to create a fan who's really into technical wrestling? Do you want to create a fan who's into like amazing storytelling? Do you want to create a fan who's into like larger than life characters? Because I'd be like, if you want a larger than life character, I'd show them the theme versus Finn Balor. If you wanted, uh, I think if you wanted a, like an artful bit of storytelling and rooting for an underdog, I'd show... Uh, one of I'd show Johnny Gargano versus uh, Almas like Andrade. Mm. I, I I just think there's there's so much good wrestling out there. Uh, you could show Ric Flair versus Shawn Michaels. I'm sorry, I love you. Like that's yeah. You know, there's so much, but it's really difficult because one match doesn't ever cover the breadth of what's gone before it. And I think that's kind of what's so good about wrestling is that you know, normally when you build to these moments and you get this big payoff in a match you've watched all the sort of preceding six months worth of stuff to get there. And you're like, well, yeah, I can't believe that happened. Yeah. I mean, I'd probably go for like, I, yeah, I, I think you're right. Like to find one match to convert a new fan. Like this is very different to the situation that might, like my, so my brother's girlfriend, we talked about this on the podcast a lot, that my brother's girlfriend has never watched wrestling before, but wants to watch a match. She is not looking to become a fan. She just wants to see a match that will be like, this is what wrestling is. Just show her Roman Reigns versus Baron Corbin, and then she's seen all of Raw and SmackDown for the last two years. Um, so I've suggested uh, Rock versus Triple H from Backlash 2000, because you've got like the McMahons, you've got uh, Austin, you've got J.R. and King on commentary, it's the Attitude Era, et cetera, et cetera. But like to convert into a fan is a completely different mm. thing. Um, well, it needs to be current yeah. then, doesn't it? Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. So I'm thinking you've got to pick like a current takeover card or so or like Revolution, like mm -hmm. something that's like really, really good. Because like Revolution's got incredible matches on it that cover a really broad, uh, broad range of uh, of styles as well. You've got that incredible tag match between Omega Page and the Young Bucks. You've got Orange Cassidy Pack. You've got a mm -hmm. title change in the main event. Um, so you've got like a lot of stuff there. And I suppose you can just I would consider the same thing for a takeover. Probably not the most recent takeover and sort of the no fans era. I would say, what was the takeover previous to that? Uh, takeover previous to no fans era. What was it meant to be? Was it Brooklyn? No, was it? Was no. It Brooklyn? no. What was it? What was it? <laughs> okay. It's a little look -see. It's sort of like Quizzlemania all over again. Yeah, I can't ever remember. So, NXT pay -per -view. We did a predictions video for it as well. Um, Portland. 
Portland, that was the one. Yeah, it was Portland. So yeah, so something like that, maybe. Um, cool, right, let's see what else we got. Kyle, uh, since it's come up a few times, most recently on Quizlemania, um, there is something that has always bothered me about the McMahon reveal as the higher power and the now iconic it's me, Austin Line. The way I remember it, besides Vince and Taker, literally the only other person on the planet in kayfabe that already knew that was Austin because Vince was one of the right officers the week before and had already revealed himself. No one seems to reference this when talking about that moment or storyline. Am I remembering it wrong? What are your thoughts? Thank you for continuing to entertain, uh, to be entertaining and keeping me up to date on the main roster content, but I can no longer bring myself to watch. Um, yeah, so I think the reason why no one ever brings that up is because people just bring up how dumb the storyline was overall. Because the, my favorite thing about the Howa Power storyline is that Vince McMahon became the higher power in order to get the belt off of Austin, right? And mm -hmm. part of that plan was to put the belt on Austin. Like in the in that storyline, Vince helps Austin get the belt. So <laughs> his grand plan was to help him. Yeah. And, I, and then not help him. It's, it's, it's genius in its own way, Luke. Uh, okay, but first of all, I think maybe the putting the belt on Austin in the first place was to galvanize the fact that he didn't want him to have it. Uh, yeah. you, you need to have the motivating factor hanging there in the balance first. Uh, wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> Res, wrestling. Uh, and thanks to Nicholas Walton for your fantasy booking submission. I passed that on to Adam. We try not to read them out on here because it can be because some of them can be very long and lengthy. Uh, but thank you very much, nonetheless. Dalton Sizemore said, uh, "Maybe I've missed something, but isn't AEW's casino, uh, casino ladder match just their version of Money in the Bank?" I'm not complaining because it, it is. I think it's a great idea. But if I hadn't really heard anyone bring this up that much, hope all is well and you're staying safe. Uh, really, it's, it's a number one contendership ladder match. Like you are, you. It's not. Money in the bank is something that you win and then cash in. So you mm -hmm. can cash in at any time. This is just you will become a you will get a, a match at the champion at some point, as opposed to when you decide. At least that's as far as I can tell. Yeah, that's what that's kind of how I was reading it. Um yeah, it's not quite as juicy as money in the bank, which is uh you know, gives you options rather than having to have a fair fight, uh, which I think is kind of the more interesting thing about Money in the Bank. Uh, but Adam and I have talked about that, actually. So if you search for Wrestle Talk clips um, on the old YouTubes, um, we posted up some exclusive content over there, which were from the Wrestle Talk podcast show on the Fight Network, which is me and Adam say, asking, do, could AEW have their own version of Money in the Bank, considering that Chris Jericho invented the match? So you could make the argument that he's the inventor of this match, we're going to have our version of it. Mm. Uh, the Zornis says, um, do you remember the headline that you had in 2018, craziest WrestleMania ever for the WrestleMania 34 review? How things have changed. I mean, at the time it was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We've just had a crazier one now. I don't know if it was crazier. I, like, I mean, Firefly Funhouse match maybe, Boneyard match, but... The rest of it was standard. So I wouldn't say crazy. Like, like it's, it's Baron weird. Corbin versus Elias wasn't that crazy. Weirder, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, RLT Sandwich, um, I was letting my mind wander at work this week, gotta love being essential, and something interesting crossed my mind. Thank you very much, first off. In the main events of WrestleMania 23, John Cena defended the WWE Championship against Shawn Michaels. In this match, HBK hit a pile driver on Cena on the unforgiving steel steps. So my question is, how different would WWE, WWE be if the pile driver was botched like Hart Austin, injured in 97, retired in 03, and Cena was, was forced to retire a few years later and was uh, barely wrestled during those latter years um would he still bury the nexus would mark henry's fake retirement be there would guys like punk or brian be pushed sooner so yeah i mean i guess this is just like what if what if cena never happened this is the uh like the, the marvel uh series yeah I mean, I mean there would just be another cena you know wwe i don't think i don't think any any of those larger than life uh top guys in wwe you know they they weren't just the only people commanding their destiny in the company. They weren't the only people who were just going like, well, it should just still be about them. Um, you know, there, there has been, Vince has a kind of one track mind about people quite often and about how you, you book things. So like, I think, you know, Cena burying the Nexus, Cena, like all this kind of protecting Cena, the character stuff would have just happened with someone else. So yeah, pro probably if they were going to do a, a Nexus or whatever, like that person 
would have squashed those people. It, it would have held back people like Punk and Daniel Bryan because that, I, I still don't think they would have been next on the list to be the face of the company. You know, they, no. they were both sort of like w, against WWE's will. They became very popular. Um, so yeah, I, I think you you know WWE would have just found the next person with the physique and the look. And the, and the skills on the microphone. And I think that would have been, you know, that's what they look for. And that's what they want as the face of their company. And it would have just been another guy. It would have been Randy Orton. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it probably would have been Randy Orton. I mean, well, I, probably not, you know. Like, the big thing about Randy Orton is he's just not a good face. He's He, he just isn't. Yeah, but that's never stopped them in the past. I know it's never stopped them in the past, but I, I feel like at the time, I think when the when Cena was around, that that was the shift they were making. You know, Cena made that conscious effort to become more PG friendly, and I think that's where they wanted the company to go. So yeah, I don't think Randy Orton would have fit that as a as you know they they need someone to do that much media, they need mm. someone to do that that many meet and greets, and they need someone to do all that stuff. And Randy Orton, it's by all accounts, is bad at that stuff like you know or well, he, not bad he's very good at it at being randy orton at those things he's not yeah. very good at being john cena like make a wish john cena you know I, that's that's kind of how i'm how i feel about it like, you know roman reigns is very good at all that stuff as well and that's why he sure he's is. so it, you know he's that's why he's the golden boy to the company nathan the alpha wolf says uh my question is um what got you to become so passionate about wrestling also uh who is someone you love but everyone hates can we passionate about wrestling uh be the rock i think is the rock mm. boy is what really drew me into to wrestling so yeah i think it's it's definitely the rock and and watching sunday night heat on channel four in the year 2000 um and yeah just sort of falling into it and then like that was certainly helped by the smackdown games um mm. being released for the playstation and just yeah loving those games great yeah, series of games bloody love the smackdown games i love the smackdown games and i love no mercy because i like i didn't have access to sky or anything so like, i no. could only watch what was on channel five wrestling wise so it was uh, quite a lot of wcw um but yeah like i think um, it was it was mostly playing games that got me into wrestling, and then I sort of had to go in and fill in the blanks afterwards. <laughs> uh, and who is someone that you love that everyone else hates? Oh bloody hell, Baron Corbin. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all like Baron, though. We all like Baron Corbin, even though he's blogged me on Twitter. Yeah, he um, blogged me on Twitter as well. I never say good things about him. I was going to say, I think I mean, it's, it's, it was Ollie dragging us all down with him with the mid card vortex stuff. <laughs> Um, God, who is someone that I like that no one else does? I feel like I'm, the, I mean, I'm the most passionate about Raven, and everyone else thinks he's fine, but I don't think yeah. anyone like, particularly says that Raven's rubbish. No, no one's, I don't think anyone thinks Raven's rubbish, but yeah, I think people just genuinely think, yeah, yeah, he's he's just okay, isn't he? He's okay, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't know if I'd like anyone that people genuinely think is terrible, yeah. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, Matt Netic Field said, I'm currently watching The Undertaker's Last Rides documentary. I'm going to be watching this over the weekend. Um, I basically, I've been putting on hold because my wife also wants to watch it, but we haven't really found the time to watch it together. So we're going to watch both parts of it over this weekend. And I'm very excited to do. Well, at least we're going to watch the first part and she's going to decide whether she wants to watch any more of it. And then, hmm. I'll, watch, and then I'll watch the rest of it on my own. Enjoy um, his T-shirts. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. WWE's about the flag. Is it? <laughs> um, and chapter one, as of writing this, uh, the honesty of the man is breathtaking. My question is, do you feel in The Undertaker's 30-year career, he should have had more title reigns, given how much Vince can rely on him? Or was the character of The Undertaker above the title and given the um, correct amount of title? Reigns as usual. Can't wait to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, Taker's always been one of those guys that he's he doesn't need to be champion. He's a spectacle. He's you know, it's that same argument we've been making about the Fiend, right? Like you know, the Fiend didn't need the Universal Title. It didn't need to be pushed into that slot. Like the Fiend, you're wasting something that you're wasting a, a narrative device. The Undertaker, I think, it feels it is the archetypical version of that role as well. Like something that can just turn up and challenge somebody to a match and suddenly everyone is excited about that match you don't need it to be about a title you don't need it to be about anything you just need it to be about the undertaker has decided he doesn't like you mm. um and therefore you have to weather the storm of the undertaker that that's a great bit of storytelling and that's like a that's something 
for wrestling that's really rare i think because you know everything else is built around oh, well i want to be the champion like it's all everything else is a sporting competition and the undertaker is just a grudge match machine he just comes <laughs> out and like oh, i just don't like you so here we go yeah uh kevin um has a bit of preamble at the start of this talking about how uh he re-watched our review of the first women's royal rumble and how we kind of pointed out in that the wwe didn't have uh, enough of a women's roster in order to sort of like facilitate 30 entrants. So there was a lot of nostalgia and NXT cameos. And he points out effectively the same thing has happened in every year since. So he says, should WWE scrap the women's rumble? I get that women should have equal opportunities, but I don't find a lot of interest in, since no one has been built as a potential winner apart from one or two. Everyone knew Asuka and Becky were going to win, and this year Charlotte was a bit of a surprise, but also the most logical choice. I think bringing back the Evolution pay-per-view and having a gold rush battle royale would be a better idea. Uh, I mean, I think you've sort of conflated two different issues there. Like, what you've essentially said is that uh, they've not built anyone good, so they should just scrap the match. Whereas, really, like, you go back to the first point and being like, well, why haven't they built anyone good? Like, that's mm. the problem here. It's called Becky Lynch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, well, like, you, the problem, again, it's that tunnel vision, isn't it? It's that we've got one person and we build that one person and everyone else is fed to the person to make them look stronger. And then that makes everyone else look rubbish yeah uh, you know like we got we we ended up having to <laughs> becky ended up having to just give the belt away like you know <laughs> becky got defeated by pregnancy um <laughs> it's yeah the one then the one and to do that like a month after the one credible person that could have beat her and you could have built a new star they made her lose the match at wrestlemania it kind of it kind of all falls into this like why did you do any of this kind of that's the feeling I always get with this stuff, especially in the women's division, because it's always about one person. But that doesn't mean you should take away the rumble. Like I feel like no. the rumble is also, you know, the rumble is also a well-deserved uh, thing for the for the legacy of women in WWE for all the crap they've been put through over the years for everything they've ever done for wrestling for everything they've ever done on shows for all the times they went out and worked really hard when given no time. Like why shouldn't they have a rumble? Why why shouldn't um, you know, just because we we have decided there's not enough people currently to fill it, like doesn't mean there won't be in the future. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't like, you know, doesn't mean you should just take away something that people have worked really bloody hard for. Um, exactly. and I think you know that's I think that's the main thing. It's like, and you know, and it's uh, one of those things. I'm not a woman. I'm I'm not watching the Rumble going like you know. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who are watching the Rumble going like I could be that one day. I can, yeah, exactly. I can be in that match. Like that's something for me to aspire to. Like men just get all of wrestling to aspire to. You know, mostly. Like I can be that guy. I yeah. definitely can't. I'm 32. <laughs> I mean, if you if you don't want to watch women's matches, just watch AEW. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dylan from Cork said, uh, "What was your favorite pay per view to go back and review?" This is in reference to uh, Wrestle Talk Extra. Uh, what is your favorite pay per view to go back and review, and what old pay per view, excluding Backlash 2000, would you like to do for Wrestle Talk Extra in the future? And for Laurie, if you could remaster one PS2 game for a current gen console, what would you pick? Ooh, okay. I'll let you answer. You, I'll, I'll give you some time to think on that one. Um, well, I think uh, favorite pay per view to go back and review was excuse me i mean survivor series 97 was an interesting one bad blood 97 was a really interesting one to go back and and re-watch um yeah a couple of the 2000s ones i really enjoyed um uh, like wrestlemania x7 obviously armageddon 2000 was really fun because i love that armageddon six man hell in a cell particularly because that was then a feature in smackdown 3 i think it was or smackdown 4 where you had the Armageddon Hell in a Cell, you could have six people in there. So yeah, I think sort of some of those ones have been my favorite ones to do. And um, aside from back, I'd like to do more WCW pay-per-views. Oh, actually, I'll tell you what, that's my answer. Halloween Havoc 1998 was my favorite one to go back and rewatch because I love that. Under that that Hulk Hogan Warrior match is so wonderfully disastrous. Uh, I think it's fascinating. But I'd like to do more old WCW pay-per-views. I think that'd be really fun to do. Game-wise, I would like them to remaster Hitman 2 uh, from the PlayStation 2, uh, and I would like them to remaster it like Hitman 2 <laughs> uh, that came out last year or whatever it was. Um, yeah, I think I, I would love to see them sort of reimagine all those levels as like sprawling, um, 
like huge environments and stuff with like multiple more characters because also i think like some of those those smaller levels are really tight but they've got like multiple ones where it's like three in a row of like the same like because they're sort of grouped by theme normally or something that mm. you're doing so like if you took all the russian ones like the st petersburg assassination and all that stuff in that that basically level two three four of the game and you just shrug them all together as one as one big long level i'd love that uh, I, to, to answer that question, um, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3, why is it not in the Tony Hawk's remasters that you're doing? Why is it only one and two? Three's the best one. <laughs> two, three is the best game. Uh, two, two is the best one, Luke. Um, Come on, three. It's got the best soundtrack. Um, Dre Smith, uh, do you think the Elite, specifically Cody, would have been better off finding a way to hide the fact that they're in charge so they aren't given scrutiny for winning? I think that would be impossible because the people who are watching AEW are those hardcore wrestling fans that would have just known. So it would be absolutely impossible for Cody Omega and the Bucks to hide the fact that they hold positions of power in AEW. Like, given their fan base, that would have been absolutely impossible. I think it also would have, like, I think the benefits of them being openly in power are far more advantageous than having them hide it. You know, like you wouldn't get that bit where they come out and they introduce their shows and everyone's cheering for them because like people have bought into those guys as characters. Yeah. But people have also bought into their sort of like their work ethic, their, their, their philosophy on wrestling and like the kind of shows that they want to put on. So having them in power makes it feel like, you know, it differentiates it from the kind of corporate structure of WWE, where I think a lot of people's opinion on Vince McMahon is that he doesn't actually really like wrestling. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't really like uh, building characters or anything like that. So like having it be in the hands of wrestlers, the argument can't be anymore that like, you know, you're not doing the right thing with these guys. You don't know what to do with wrestlers because mm. they do know what to do with wrestlers. They are wrestlers. So I think, yeah. it, I think it, it just gets rid of so many silly questions and like, you know, I think the the, pro the problem they actually have more in AEW is that people want to see them win. Not That's that it, not, yeah. you know, people like people aren't like going, oh, Triple H again. Like people people are going like, oh yeah, man, like I really want to see Cody win. And Cody's exactly, done yeah. a brilliant job of losing so much to the point where people are desperate for him to win now. Yeah. Uh Marcel Jura, today I received an email that you understandably have made the call to cancel the Battle of Red Rest. As you may know by now, I originally wanted to be there in March, surprising you and have a great two-day trip in London, maybe one day. Uh, that leads me to my question. What are your suggestions to do if you're on a city holiday in London? Any recommendations for a vegetarian who loves nerd culture, wrestling, and has a big heart for the obscure? Yeah, it kind of sucks that we had to cancel Brit Rest mm. Marcel. It's funny one when we when we first made the call, the uh, we we were kind of having a debate whether we should cancel or postpone, and we made the decision to postpone. Um, and we effectively said like the com like the conversation we had then was like. Because if we then have to cancel it down the line, like if we have to cancel it, like when we did for the second date, there's much bigger things to worry about. So like, and we're now in a position where we're like, yeah, there are way bigger things to worry about. Um, so yeah, it kind of sucks, but uh, so recommendations for what to do in London. For a vegetarian, you've got to go to Mildred's, which is in uh, Soho, um, yeah. so, so basically central London. That is one of the best vegetarian restaurants in town. Um, so you've got, uh, you, because you can't book a table for it, can you? So you can, can now. So you oh, can, can now. You, know? well, so you can't book it online or anything, but you can uh, turn up, put your name down, and you can go away. And then the uh, court, so you can go to a pub nearby. When pubs, when we get pubs back, give us back our pubs. Yeah. Uh, when we get pubs back, you can go to a pub and uh, then wait, and they'll text you, and you can go in. So it's not no longer have to queue good. outside, which was crap before. It was crap, wasn't it? I really hated that as well. I, I that is my worst thing about Russia. Oh. I hate it so much. Because like me, so me and my brother went to go there, and we we said like, you know, how long's the wait? And they said, oh, it's probably about forty minutes. We were like, oh, okay, cool. So we, uh, you know, can we put our names down? They said, yeah, you can put our names down, but like we we don't call or text you. And we we're like, well, we want to go to the pub. And they were like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. you just have to come back in forty minutes and just sort of hope that no one's jumped ahead of you. And I was like, that's a bit wow. of a crap service. But anyway, I'm glad they've now changed that. So yes, Mildred's one hundred percent because that food is brilliant. Yeah, so I'd go there. Um, I mean, if you've never been to London before, I would just then do a loop around Soho down to the South Bank uh, and just see all the sites, basically. 
Yeah, um, you're, you're you're within from there. You're within range of uh, Piccadilly Circus, Leicester Square, um, Trafalgar Square, Houses of Parliament, etc. London Eye. <laughs> like you could just do all of that in an hour, <laughs> <laughs> and then and then and then think of something else to do. Like go yeah. to uh, if you're a big if you're a big nerd and into nerd culture, there's a huge Forbidden Planet, but that's not very interesting. You could go to Loading Bar, which is pretty good. You go to Four Quarters, which is in Stratford, which is a gaming bar. That's pretty cool. Yep. Um, Prince Charles Cinema. If you want to go and like check out really old school um, cinema, like particularly if you're there when they've got a really good event on, like if they have mm -hmm. a quote along or a sing along or something like that. It's a bit touristy. There's a Namco arcade on South Bank as well, uh, where the aquarium is. That's quite a good one. That's mm -hmm. what I mean. not amazing, but it's quite fun. Um, yeah. There's also a really weird. I found a really cool arcade, which is uh, just in. It's like literally in the middle of Soho. It's like off. Uh, what's that road called poland street i think mm -hmm. um and it's literally just like tucked under a gam like a casino thing and it's but it's like oh, it's yeah. so much stuff i was like whoa this is crazy like there's hundreds of dance dance revolution machines in there yeah it's great. So one by tottenham court road yeah 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 me and my friend went to go uh there but we uh, i can't remember why we didn't go in the end but yeah i'd recommend that fortunately heart of gaming is not in technically in london anymore it's that moved from acton to croydon i think mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you can get to Croydon, uh, I'd recommend it. This is the new Hard Gaming. It's very nice. Very easy, it's very easy to get to. Yeah. Um, our weirdest question of the week goes to Flaming Clive. Uh, what wrestler would you turn gay for? Uh, don't say Keith Lee because we all know it's him. Um, Adam Cole, I think he's that. I was going to say Adam. I was going to say Adam Cole as well. He's a handsome man. He's got great. He's got great taste in games and stuff like that. He's a handsome dude. Um, and he says, uh, also, Luke, buddy, you keep saying good shout. What uh, WTF does that mean? Is it a British thing while the rest of the world says good choice or great pick? Um, yeah, I mean, it's just good choice. Great shout, mate. Great shout. Great shout. Uh, Frank Bortello. Uh, hey, guys, uh, I know you have been busy and don't have time to do extra stuff, especially punishment videos. So I have a suggestion. Instead of the music videos, which take a lot of editing and time um, for live, uh, why don't you do live reactions to bad matches? The winners of either Quizlemania or Wrestle League would pick since you guys know each other very well and knows what matches the loser will hate. Maybe it will help motivate Ollie to uh, do better or help Laurie to take the quiz a little more seriously. I think you guys, uh, I think it could help you guys. Seriously. <laughs> You can have you guys a lot since you can do it from home and most bad matches aren't that long. And let's face it, suffering makes good content. I, while I appreciate the suggestion, like, I don't know if watching bad wrestling is like a punishment because at the end of it, I'd just go like, cool, it was a bad match, I guess. Uh, yeah. I lost something. <laughs> yeah. Except uh, time. Yeah, exactly. I lost some time. If you have to um, watch it for 24 hours back to back, then maybe. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Um, Irakli, uh, tell me I'm not the only one who hates the AEW Women's Championship belt. You're not the only one. Um, Owen Huang says, I recently dove into a rabbit hole of Vince Russo booking in TNA and WCW. And while it's quite hilarious, uh, I don't imagine, I uh, can't imagine how depressing it was to have been a fan of those promotions during those times. Oh, it was rough, particularly TNA for me. Mm. My question is, do you guys think that some of Vince McMahon's current booking and writing is on par with that of Vince Russo's worst booking and writing? Because some of McMahon's current decisions and booking uh, make me want to tear my hair out. And I imagine it's the same feeling that WCW and TNA fans were fear uh, feeling during R Russo's reign of terror. I couldn't disagree more. Like Vince Russo is so much way worse than Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon leaves you being like, oh, that was an odd choice. But Vince Russo's book, it makes you be like, why? That yeah. None of this makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's, there's, there's almost a through line with WWE sometimes. It's just, it's you know, it's normally just to further someone you didn't want to win. Uh, yeah. It's never like, I don't know. It's never out. It's never outlandishly ridiculous. Like even, even Otis catching a briefcase that fell into his hands. Like while I would say probably bad booking, uh, yeah. it makes sense. Like there's a, there's a, there's a through line of logic to that match and to, to Otis's character that happened there. I just don't think it's like the greatest choice. And uh, Vince McMahon has never killed a wrestling company. Uh, whereas <laughs> Vince Russo's had a few. Well, uh, sorry, <laughs> but, well, Vince McMahon's killed plenty of wrestling companies, just not his <laughs> one. <laughs> just his own one. Yeah. Um, Abraham says, now that Drake Maverick is in the triple threat for the Cruiserweight Championship next week, let's assume he wins. Having him lose clean, um, 
having him lose clean is the worst possible outcome. Having him win has its problems too. Um, so what if he loses in some sort of angle? I was thinking a kayfabe full scale, uh, full sale screw job. It works because it blurs the lines, uh, uh, blurs the exploitative things they're doing. It's not a great idea, but it's the least bad. What are your thoughts? I think he wins. Uh, I think you. I feel like if you wanted to give, you know, if 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 what they're saying about Phantasma is that this heel turn's coming, and you know he's the one running all the the luch the master luchadors that are beating everyone up, and it's you know, this whole like babyface initial run is a ruse to get to the final of this, uh, to get to the final of the cruiserweight tournament. Like, if you have him turn and beat Maverick. Mm. To win the cruiserweight championship that is molten heat like yeah you, you know if you are if you're knuckling down on this idea that you know screw the real man's life like we're going to use it for a story uh that's what i would do if you were going to go to like the, the extreme version of that i would have drake overcome two guys um to win his way into the final because that then puts that that makes him like the ultimate kind of overcoming underdog there and then i would yeah have phantasma literally cheat to win yeah. Uh, El Coco Benjamin, um, how do you guys see the current Dark Order gimmick playing out? Personally, ever since the Mr. Brody Lee character was introduced, I've been theorizing that the, uh, the Eve Luno and Stu Grayson will eventually turn face to topple the Exalted One. Dark Order Hollywood versus Dark Order Wolfpack, anyone? Seriously, though, the Dark Order with Brody Lee isn't working for me. P.S. Been meaning to ask, Luke, what games do you watch on uh, Games Done Quick? It's the Resi games for me. Um, so yeah, first on the Dark Order thing, I'll, yeah, I, I'm curious to see what's going to happen once Grayson and Uno can get out of Canada and kind of like, the, the, I, I don't really think we can get an idea of what this group is now in its third guys, I guess, until we get Uno and Grayson back. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I really, I, I, Brody Lee's uh, promo that he had on, on AEW this week made me just be like, oh, I love the character and I love this version of Brody Lee. And the the interview that we've got going up today on Rest Talk interviews that the Louis Dangor did with him is just like it makes me love Brody Lee even more. Like what a nice guy. Um, as far as lots of ambulances and fire engines running past my house, driving past my house, if you will. Um, Certainly in the slightest. No, nope. oh, no, that happens a lot. This is a very old area. Um, so uh, um, yeah, so I don't know on that one. Um, with regards to GDQ, uh, I love the Sonic uh, Sonic Blocks. Um, I really, really like relay races. My favorite um, GDQ events was the uh, Mario Brothers Speed uh, Mario Brothers Relay Race, where they did Mario Brothers, Mario Brothers Two, uh, Mario Brothers Three, Mario Brothers Lost Levels, and Mario World in a relay race. I thought that was great. And the um, uh, Mario Maker relay races are always really fun as well. So yeah, I think those and the, the Resident Evil 2 race was really good last year. Uh, not race rather, but the speed run was really good last year. I'm trying to find the name. Ah, that's it. Have you ever watched uh, Scott Falco stuff on YouTube, Luke? I have not. Uh, so he does uh like he's he's an animator and like comedian, but he does uh one of his series is like totally legit totally legit speed runs of games. Yeah, he just animates the speed run as if it was like the game. So all the characters are reacting to what's happening in the speed run version. Uh oh, cool. it does a really good one of like the Wind Waker because the one of the main Wind Waker um tricks is that you sort of you you keep pausing the game and then mm -hmm. glitching it so that link travels backwards through the ocean on his own yeah <laughs> so, like this young link is just going ja, da, 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 and then, all the way through it. like it's it's really really funny I've, um, done, I've not done it justice at all I'll, I'll give that a look though uh the other one that i would i absolutely loved from i think it was actually from this year's uh from gdq in january was the Doom 2016 100% run because, I mean, I love Doom 2016 and they've done glitch runs of it uh, a couple of times, but I loved the glitchless 100% run. It was so much fun to watch. That's a gr I, that, that's that's how I liked. I don't, I'm not really into much of the glitched ones. I like to see people just play the game really well. Yeah, I mean, um, glitching, yeah, sort of like, I could do it in 10 minutes or something. Yeah. yeah. Take like, all the fun out of the game, why don't you? Completing Mario 64 in like eight minutes because you can just jump through the final door at the end is way less fun than watching someone go through and getting all the stars. Mm. Um, Jobber JJ says, um, one year after the first double or nothing, how would you sum up AEW's first year and what can they do to improve? Have a nice day. I think they've had a great first year. Uh, I think particularly in 2020, they've had a, a fantastic run of shows. I think the 2020 has really picked up for them. I think you can very much split it into three different eras. There was pre-Dynamite, 
first run Dynamite, 2020 Dynamite. And I think 2020 Dynamite is where they've really found their feet and put on some really great stuff. And coincidentally, that's when Tony Khan took more power, if reports to be believed. Uh, the only thing that needs to be improved is their women's division. Mm -hmm. I, again, I think also, like we said earlier, like that, you know, it's that build of brand new stars. Like so some of the, it's time to start elevating some of the some of the other guys that you've brought in as like you know you were like these are the biggest names from the indie scene. It's time to give those guys some some props over the WWE talent. But yeah. Uh, I, I can't really complain. <laughs> Abnehav, after seeing Kenny on Quizzlemania and listening to his stories, it got me thinking, if there was a table for three, but for YouTube wrestling channels, who would you like to see on that? I'd like to see uh, the heads of my three favorite channels, WrestleTalk, uh, Ollie, Cultaholic, Pachiti, and Going In Raw Steve. They could talk about the receding hairlines of their second in charge, Luke, Ross, and Larson. I mean, that would be funny, only Ollie's receding hairline is dreadful, and so is Steve's. <laughs> 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 so, I feel Pachiti's got something going on underneath oh, that. One hundred percent, yeah. Under, yeah. Those, under those curls. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, who would, I mean, who would I like to see on a, a table for three before wrestling YouTube channels? Hmm, hmm. it's got to be wrestling ones. I don't know because we're part of one. I don't think that's uh, fair. Like maybe like Steve, Brian, and Alex. I think it'd be fun. Hmm. Pete. Andy <laughs> and housemate Simon. Yeah. Uh, Callum, uh, what in your opinion is the worst wrestling angle done by WCW, WWE, and TNA in their prime? Thank you guys for the great content in this uncertain time. Um, worst wrestling angle by WCW is probably David Arquette winning the title. Oh. <laughs> probably, like it just Goodness backfired me. massively. Like, mm. just really did not work. Um, and actually really like the, the botching of, I mean, it's either that actually, no, I'm going to change my mind. It's not that one. It's going to be botching Sting's title win at Starcade 97. Like you spent all that time to build to that match and politics bollocks did all up. And now you've got Eric Bischoff and Hogan being like, no, no, it was Sting's fault. Get out, mate. Just get, absolutely get out, mate. Um, yeah. TNA, what was the worst angle TNA did? I think actually because it derailed him so much, Samoa Joe getting kidnapped by ninjas and coming back with a penis drawn on his face um, really didn't work for him. Um, it didn't, I, I, didn't work for him. Yeah. Um, yeah, TNA has done some really bad stuff. TNA's got like an incredible track record of terrible angles. Um, yeah, I don't know. What about you? Ooh, the worst ever. I don't know. Like, I think WCW David Arquette is is completely correct <laughs> i hate when they do things for promotional purposes uh, yeah um see i never really watched a lot of tna back in the day so I don't, I don't know i just remember like every time i did watch it all that was ever happening was backstage meetings with hogan um, <laughs> so <laughs> i just feel like all of it was like a really boring episode of the office but <laughs> um and then wwe like what what was their worst ever angle? I feel like, I mean, because it's been covered recently on uh, the dark side of the ring, the the exploitive nature of Hawk's alcoholism, um, oh. um, putting that on TV, uh, I don't think was great. Um, I mean, they've got such a history of using people's real life dramas in terrible ways. Yeah, and and because it was referenced on Quizzlemania this week, having the Pretty Mean Sisters fake a uh, miscarriage, uh, I don't think it was pretty great. I mean, there's a lot of it's a lot of Vince Russo stuff in the in the Attitude Era giving birth. Shagging to a corpse, shagging a corpse, you know, all that sort of stuff. There's a, again a whole litany of things that you can mm. pick from. Um, I thought of another one in CNA for a second. Then um, that was it because again, I, don't know, I feel like I'm just this whole episode is dunking on Russo, but um, because he managed because he managed to bollocks up Kurt Angle versus Samoa Joe. Like that is that takes some skill in order to bollocks that up when he introduced uh, Samoa Joe's girlfriend for an episode so that Kurt Angle could put her in an ankle lock to make Samoa Joe accept another match. And then we never saw that girlfriend ever again. I was like, well, why should I have cared? Like, why should I have cared about this girlfriend if she was, yeah, just a tool? Storytelling, um, Luke, storytelling. Isaiah Kennard said, uh, who do you think will be the first former Raw or SmackDown women's champion to join AEW? Oh, uh, who is likely? Mm, that's a good question, that one. Former women's champion. I mean, it'd be someone like Sasha Banks, wouldn't it? Like, it, yeah, I feel like she's, yeah, she's definitely on that list of people who 
I don't think would be opposed to going. Um, depends on what happens, I think, in this Bailey. I think it probably all rides on the Bailey feud, really, doesn't it? Like, what her decisions are going to be going forward. Yeah, because I feel like all the How women... she got left on her contract? I don't know, actually. Because um, I feel like a, like a lot of the women that are that are former champions in WWE feel like lifers there, like mm. like a Charlotte Flair, like a Bailey, a Becky Lynch. Like I don't feel like they're really Ronda Rousey, Alexa Bliss. Like I don't really see any of them going anywhere. Asuka might have been one, but like I feel like Asuka is probably going to be there for the long haul. Um, yeah, so I, it's a, that's a, that's a tough one, really. Um, got Carmella, but I feel like Carmella's going to be there forever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Julian Diaz, could you recap some of AEW's main storylines going into Double or Nothing? It's been hard to keep up with everything going on in the world. Well, I would suggest watching The Road to Double or Nothing, which I believe airs tonight, uh, because that will just recap everything. That will, that will be, in an hour, everything you need to know going into the pay-per-view on Saturday. Um, Alex Kirkman, are there any old WWE shows that make you feel really nostalgic? Mine's Rumble 92 for obvious reasons, WrestleMania 7, my absolute favourite, Survivor Series 1990. Um... Yeah, so, uh, oh, yeah, so speaking of which, I would like to say thank you, especially Luke, for the amazing research you put into extra pay per view podcast. Uh, it's by Country Mom, my favorite content, but my favorite bit is listening to the facts and research you've looked up, Survivor Series 1997 in particular. Um, give yourself a pat on the back. Thank you very much, Ollie. Give that man a pay rise. Oh, I don't know why I had to read out that last bit there, but it was just, a, it really jumped out to me. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I bold and um, underlined it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's the answer, answer I always give is Backlash 2000s. Just staying up, uh, you know, midnight, staying up till 4 a.m. to watch Austin return and see The Rock win the title. Uh, yeah, really, really nostalgic memories for me watching that live on Channel 4 and then going into, like, that whole 2000 pay-per-view period, it just makes me feel so nostalgic going into school the following day to talk with your mates about what happened and mm. or like if your mate stayed up and watched it and you didn't because it was on sky and then you got trying to avoid all the paper you got trying to avoid all the results you got the certain kids you know to avoid at school because they're the ones who are going to tell you like the big dicks they are while you wait for your mate to watch it on vhs so he can then give it lend it to you a couple of days later so you can go home and watch it that's, I mean, what yeah. they, that's, about, that's nostalgia for me all I ever watched was old WCW though, so like I didn't, I never saw the pay per views because we didn't get them. I only ever watched like weekly programming, and obviously that's bloody disappointing <laughs> <laughs> for WCW. So like my nostalgia doesn't really get uh, tickled anymore um, because yeah, you're just like, oh god, this was bad, wasn't it? <laughs> Whereas as a kid, I was like, yeah, Goldberg, why? <laughs> Uh, Lynn Bell, um, uh, I want to purchase Silver Bro's book on Amazon um, and Indigo, which is Canada's bookstore, but it's out of stock. Any idea when it will come back or is there anywhere else a Canadian can purchase it? Also, I haven't seen Laurie in a while. Did I miss an upload with him somewhere in it? Thank you so much for the content. Always a lovely time with the boys. Jam that jam. There he is. There's I, Laurie right there. I've been on holiday. Yeah, he's on holiday been. in my own house. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and the predictions video yesterday you were on. I was in the predictions video. Yeah, so I've been, yeah, I've not been on... I don't remember the last video I was in. Probably was in NXT in, uh, was that... Pardon? An NXT review, maybe? I think I skipped the NXT review last week. Last week you did, yeah. I yeah, so yeah, the so I, I haven't been in a video for two weeks. Um, yeah. I just did it. Well, I was in Explained on Parts of Unknown, which you should watch. But should uh, watch. that was the last thing I was in on, yeah, yeah. the week. Uh, and as for my book, I don't know. That's down to the publisher to when it's going to be back in stock. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if Barnes and Noble. I'm pretty sure they still got copies of it. Because someone asked me recently where it, you can get a copy of it. And I, I had a quick Google and I could find it on Barnes and Noble. If you just Google the book name, there'll be it will list all the shops that are selling it. Um, and lastly, from Marcus Campbell, what do you make of the starting roster for Retro Mania? Uh, who do you think they'll add in future updates? It's a cool little lineup they've got, actually, because they've just announced um, Zack Ryder, well, Matt Cardona and um, uh, Kurt Hawkins for it. Have a look who else is on the roster. I think Lance Archer's in it, isn't he? Is Lance Archer on it? Is it Murder? In the Murder Hawk. Um, so we have got, um, obviously, Stevie Whoa. Richards, Road Warrior, Hawk and Animal, Zack Sabre Jr., Colt Cabana, Tommy Dreamer, um, Johnny Nitro, Blue Meanie, Nick Aldis, and Austin Idol. Um, mm -hmm. What else we got in there? There's more uh, in there as well. Yeah, yeah. Nikita Koloff, Jeff Cobb, uh, Warhorse. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's really cool. Like, I'm really looking forward to playing it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I think it, yeah, it's 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 a very interesting mix of people. Uh, yeah. Look at yeah. Zach's in there. Like the fact that Zach's in there is the one that makes me most excited. 
Mm. Uh, yeah, I think it's gonna be, it looks really good. The game I've been yeah. watching like the some of the demo stuff they've been doing. It does look really really fun. Um, I could I, certainly see them if they if this game does well. I could see AEW trying to get in and try to get some of their guys in. Yeah, true. Like it's outside good. outside of their own game, I could see yeah. them just like well, I mean, the characters it, in. It depends on what the deal is for their new game. I guess is I the, suppose, yeah. yeah. How exclusive that is. But that is all we have got time for on this edition of the podcast. Thank you all so much for watching. Please do click the videos that have appeared on screen right now to catch up with more awesome Wrestle Talk stuff. And download the podcast version of this show for extra content. I have been Luke Cohen. This has been Elf Fake to Laura Blake, and that was wrestling.